first time to give a talk here. I'm very happy that she came back again. And she will talk about the algorithms of planar digital paths. Yeah, please. Hello everyone. <laughs> Hello everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Today I'm going to talk about planar disjoint path problem. First of all, let's start with the disjoint path problem. In this problem, we are given a graph and a set of vertex pairs. Then our goal is to connect each vertices in each pair. So we want to compute a path connecting SI and TI. And moreover, such uh, such, uh, moreover, the path must be vertex disjoint. <coughs> and this is ge a natural generalization of some connectivity problem. So this problem was studied very, uh, had, had been studied very um, extensively. First of all, this problem is NP-complete, and it was proved by COP 1975. <coughs> And this reduction implies that, under some reasonable conjecture, no 2 to the or order of m time algorithm exists. Here, m denotes the number of edges of the graph. There is a matching upper bound. Consider each <coughs> subgraph, subgraph of G and check if it is a correct solution or not. This simple algorithm is takes uh, to see the order of m time, which is optimal. So if we measure the running time as a function of the size of the graph, we already know the best, the, the optimal running time of this al algorithm mm -hmm. the, for this problem. So we, the natural uh, direction of the study on this joint path problem is to consider the parameterized complexity of this problem. Here we measure the running time in terms of the graph size and the number of terminals, the, the size of t. In this case, we can, uh, the reduction implies that no two to the order of k times some point n time algorithm exists. <coughs> On the other hand, we can solve this problem in n cube time, and later this algorithm was improved to take quadratic time. But here, the bound, the dependency on k is not explicit. And rough estimation says that this bound is at least 2 to the, two to the, two to the order of k. So this is very large. It is not practical. So uh, first, I will introduce the general framework of these two algorithms. First, they use uh, a technique called irrelevant vertex technique. <coughs> we say a vertex is irrelevant if this in instance is equivalent to this instance. This means that. If there is a solution in this instance, <coughs> if and only if there are k disjoint paths in G minus V. So if we can find the irrelevant vertex, then we can safely remove vertex V from our graph. So by repeatedly applying this procedure, we can reduce the size of the graph. So first they showed that if a graph has large tr tr tree width, then we can find an irrelevant vertex. So we can apply this procedure repeatedly until our graph has a small tree width. Then now we have a small, uh, simple instance. Then we use the second dilemma. There is an algorithm running in to, to the W log W time for the disjoint path problem. Here W is the true width of the graph. Oh, so you don't need the n? Uh, the number times n. Uh, okay. <laughs> 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 uh, 
And so by applying this lemma to our smaller instance, we can obtain desired uh, running time. So to improve this running time, there are two directions. First, we want to improve the dependency on K. Or we can design faster algorithms for special classes of graphs. For the first direction, it is still open. The best known bounds are the, the best known bound is this GK. And the second direction is the topic we're going to talk about today. More specifically, we will deal with a planar graph. We are given a planar graph and a set of vertex pairs. Here, these vertices are, are called terminals. And we want to find a set of disjoint, a vertex disjoint path. And this set is called a T-linkage. There are two previously known results. The first one takes time linear in N, but the dependency in K is large. The second one has a better dependency on K, but it takes N to the sixth time. And by combining these two results, we obtained uh, an algorithm with this one time. So today I will introduce our algorithm. But because our algorithm is based on these two previous results, I will first introduce these results, and then I will show how to what's the the, the difficulties in improving the, these algorithm, and I will show how to improve these difficult difficulties. What is the reason why you put the Bruce Reed and Adler et al uh, together? Uh, read shows that the uh, show that the correct bound here is a single exponential and later Adler and showed Adler uh, uh, sorry read showed that this problem can be solved in <coughs> linear time mm -hmm. and Adler shows that it the correct bound on the correct bound of the algorithm of Lee takes this time. Mm -hmm. So the algorithm comes from this algorithm, uh, this paper, but its <coughs> analysis comes from Adler and others. So first, I will talk about the first algorithm. First, they showed that if we have a large number of concentric cycles not containing any terminal in their interior, so the red terminals are concentric, and all terminals lie outside <coughs> of the cycle. Then, all vertices in the interior of the innermost cycle are irrelevant. So if there is a T-linkage, intersecting the innermost uh, cycle, then we can reroute so that this path uh, does not intersect the interior of the innermost cycle. And they show how to find all such irrelevant vertices in linear time. Also, if G does not contain any set of 2 to the order of K concentric cycles, not containing any terminal, then the tree width of the graph is two to the order of k. And we use the uh, algorithm for the distinct path for graphs with bounded tree width. Then we finally obtain an algorithm with this one. And we want to improve this algorithm. There are two directions. First, we, I, if it is possible to improve the bound on the, for the tree width, then we can obtain a faster algorithm. 
but unfortunately, this bond is tight. This is an example. This graph has a unique T linkage. The first one connects S and S1 and T1 in this way, and the second one connects mm -hmm. this way. And you can see that this is a unique T linkage. But it has a large grid, which means that its tree width is at least 2 to the order of K. So this bound is tight. And also, <coughs> this bound is almost tight. For a planar graph, even if we have a, a graph with bounded tree width, Uh, the best, uh, the optimal, any algorithm takes at least two to the order of w time. Under the reasonable conjecture, so these algorithms are almost tight, and these bounds are almost tight. So to improve this algorithm, we need a totally different approach. And Lostanov and others did that. But to do this, they used some other algorithm by Schreiber. This algorithm takes n to the order of k time. So it is very, uh, it is not that efficient, but this algorithm is general than the others. This algorithm can deal with uh, directed planographs. But Brooks Tunnel and others used some ideas from uh, the second one. A main tool of the second uh, second result is to anal analyze is analysis of homology classes of flow functions, and in our case, we can reinterpret it as uh, discretely homotopic classes of weak T linkages. A T linkage is a set of vertex disjoint paths, but a weak T linkage is a set of walks. So a single vertex can be visited more than once, but they must be non-crossing. So here, these two path two paths intersect, but they are non-crossing, not crossing. So using same as is allowed now. Uh, using same edges. So the green and blue intersect, right? Yes, so they use the same edge. Uh. And we say two weak linkages are discrete homotopy if one can obtain from the other by applying the following phase operations. So if uh, we apply a phase operation on this phase, then this part is replaced with this part. So it is a variant of the classical homotopy to the uh, to planographs. And if we have this walk, <coughs> then we can contract this part. So we can contract or we can remove this upper triangle. So the left one and the right one are discretely homotopy. First, we apply a phase operation on this phase, then the green path moves, traverses in this way, and then we can apply a phase operation on this phase. Then the, we have a new, new path. So these two, <coughs> two weak linkages are discrete homotopy. And Schreiber showed that we can enumerate n to the order of k discretely homotopy classes, one of which is the correct homotopy class of a T linkage. So if we have a T linkage, then we can by, apl by applying phase operations, we can transform this T linkage 
into one of the uh, Richter linkage enumerated by this algorithm. And this algorithm takes n to the order of k time. And as a second step, given a correct homotopic class or a given a weak linkage homotopic to a t linkage, we can compute a t linkage in n to the sixth time. Uh, okay. Question. So when you say enumerate distinct uh, discrete homotopic classes, you mean? Actually, it enumerates n to the order of k weak t linkages. Yeah, so all possible homotopic classes? No. Uh. But there are more than, uh, more than n to the order of k uh, discrete homotopic classes, but some of them is but they enumerate some of them. But uh -huh. it is guaranteed that it contains a, homo a correct homotopic class. You mean if there exists one? Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So this is after fixing the planar invariant, right? Yes. Right. It, it, for the Otherwise, we cannot define yeah. discrete homotopy. Can it do it for the time? I mean, planar invariant. Oh. I don't know. Yes, yes, linear time. You can, you can do this in linear time. Can I go back? So what is that? Can I see the homotopic class? Okay, so definitely. Ah. What is on? Oh, so, so for homotopic class, uh, you save uh, some pair of terminals and then some linkage between the pairs? Uh, two weak two linkages are discrete homotopic. Yeah, so the... The homotopic class means that you, you uh, put uh, some representative t yes, linkage. Yes, right? yes, yes. So, a weak, so it is represented by a weak t linkage. Some weak t linkage. So basically, it computes, it enumerates n to the order of k weakly homotopic classes. Uh, if, um, does everything in the sequence of homotopy equivalents need to be uh, a disjoint? Uh, is they must be non crossing. Okay. But here, this bound, to obtain this bound, Schroeder does not use the, even to use the uh, irrelevant vertex technique. So, to reduce the improved the running time of this algorithm, the first one, is to reduce the number of homotopic classes we consider. And this is what Lokstanov and others did. They used the fact that our graph has a tree width of 2 to the order of k. So using this tree width bound, they reduce the number of discrete homotopic classes we have to consider. And they can enumerate all such uh, all such weak t linkages in quadratic time. But the bottleneck lies here. So to improve the algorithm by Lux Tanov and others, we have to open up the black box. This, this is what we did. We showed that we can do this in linear time. If a given weak t linkage satisfies a certain condition. But unfortunately, the weak t linkages enumerated by this algorithm does not satisfy this property. Mm -hmm. So we have to uh, design a new algorithm for the first step as well. So given the homotopic class, is there always a t linkage satisfying the no, same? No. If uh, <coughs> if it exists, we can find it. Uh -huh. But mm -hmm. if no such uh, t-link exists, then we report no. Mm -hmm. Does it this method or support for the bounded genus case? We don't know. <laughs> it is an open problem. So. 
as I mentioned earlier, looks ton of algorithm also use this framework. First, they remove all irrelevant vertices. Then our graph has two width of two to the order of k, and then they enumerate two to the order of k squared weak t linkages one of which is homotopic to a t linkage. Then they use a black box. For the second step, they use a Steiner tree, which is called a backbone tree. This can be computed in quadratic time and focus on a single path in a T-linkage. They cut this path with respect to the backbone tree and then they push each segment towards the Schuttiner tree in this way. Then a path becomes a walk on the backbone tree. Then, the con then they showed that uh, yes. uh, because we, when we push a tail linkage onto the backbone tree, we use face operations only. So the constructed weak, weak tail linkage is more topic to the original tail linkage. And they showed that this constructed weak tail linkage use uses each edge of the tree and most to the order of k times. Here they use this tree with bound. And they showed that the number of weak t linkages satisfying this property is bounded by two to the order of k squared. <coughs> and here, once we have a backbone tree, we can enumerate all such paths in linear time, n times two to the k squared. But this is the bottleneck of the runtime there algorithm. And for the second step, so our, our starting point was to analyze the algorithm for the second step, the third step, which takes n to the sixth time. <coughs> and by carefully, carefully analyzing the Shriver's algorithm, we observe that this algorithm indeed takes n to the fifth times the number of violations. <coughs> Here, the violation, a violation is defined as follows. It is a vertex traversed by a given weak to linkage at least twice. For example, here, this vertex is traversed at least twice, and this vertex is traversed twice, and this one also, it is also traversed exactly twice. So the number of violations of this T, this T weak linkage is three. So if the constructed weak T linkage has a small, small number of violations, then Schreiber's algorithm takes n to the fifth time. But look at this example. Um, by their construction, every vertex in the Steiner tree can be a violation. Can can be a violation for the constructed weak to linkage. So the number of violations can be as large as n. So we introduce some other way to construct, to enumerate weak to linkages so that the construct, constructed weak to linkage has a small number of violations. So this is our approach. We design a new backbone structure. To do this, we construct, we decompose the graph with respect to k cycles, these cycles. Then we have k rings, k rings. Uh, in fact, the innermost one is a disk, but the others are rings. 
and here each cycle consists of two to the order of k vertices. So the complexity of each cycle is small. It's not is it is independent on the uh, graph complexity. And the enormous one contains a terminal, and the second one does not contain any terminal, and the third one contains terminal. The terminal containing rings and terminal free rings appear alternately. And moreover, by our construction, the distance between two boundary curves for terminal containing ring is small. I, I have a question. Hmm? So you, in the first line you said graph is triangle, you can assume the graph is triangulated. Uh, yes. uh, if it is not tr triangulated, it is not a cycle. We do not use a cycle. Instead of that, we use uh, curve visiting oh. vertices but not crossing edges. I see. So in a real, so you, you cannot really change the problem to triangulated graph, but right. So you're not changing. It the is distance. for, uh, to, for just for presentation. Yes, it's just for presentation. And we deal with each ring separately. Here, this distance means that. Minimum of four vertices? Yes, 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 yes. For any pair of, uh, so there is a pair of vertices whose distance is uh, at most to the root of k. So for a ring containing a terminal, We construct the backbone tree as follows. First, we compute a shortest path between two boundary cycles. Yeah. And for each terminal, we connect it with the uh, one of the boundary curves. Then they form they form a forest. <coughs> this is the second component of our backbone structure. And for the third one, we add these two boundary cycles. Then by construction, the total complexity of this structure is 2 to the order of k. And therefore, the number of pieces of uh, t linkage contained in this ring is bounded by 2 to the order of k. So this part, the number of t linkages is bounded by 2 to the order of k. And for each piece, we push them onto the backbone structure. If we can consider it as a disk, we can always can do this. This is backbone structure for a ring containing a terminal. <coughs> then we look at the other type of rings. Terminal con ter terminal free ring. In this case, the distance between two boundary curves can be large. But even in this case, the boundary cycle has a small complexity. For this, we the backbone structure in this ring consists of the two boundary curves and then a maximum number of disjoint paths between the two boundary curves. Here, the terminal pairs are not specified. So using a max flow algorithm, we can compute a maximum number of disjoint paths between the two boundary curves in linear time. And because the true width is small, 
there are at most two to the order of k disjoint paths. <coughs> if the distance is very large. Then we look at each piece of the of a tail linkage intersecting this ring. For a piece whose endpoints are contained in the same bounded curve, we call it a visiting piece. We push them onto the bounded curve. And if a segment of piece traverse the ring, then we push them onto boundary curves and one of the disjoint paths. We pre-compute it. And because we have a maximum number of disjoint paths, we can push them so that a single disjoint path is used by at most one traversing side, a traversing keys. Summary. Our backbone structure looks like this. It consists of several boundary cycles and for a ring containing a terminal we construct a forest which we call a skeleton forest and for a ring not containing any terminal we construct a number of disjoint paths then given a T linkage we push them onto the backbone structure. We basically cut the cut each path with, with respect to the crossings between the path and the backbone structure, and then we push them, as I mentioned earlier. In this way, we show that every edge of the backbone structure is traversed and most two to the order of k times. And using this property, uh, recall that this property also holds for the backbone, backbone tree of Rook's tunnel and others. And using this fact, we show that the number of different weak t linkages enumerated by our algorithm is two to the order of k squared. <coughs> and in our case, we have one more property. Each edge of the computed disjoint path is used by at most once. This is due to this property. So now Let's analyze the number of violations. Uh, in the backbone structure, every edge, excluding the ones on the disjoint path, uh, the backbone structure has uh, a two to the order of k. Uh, to the order of edges, excluding this part. The other part consists of two to the order of k vertices. And for this part, does not contain any violation by our construction. So the total number of violation is two to the order of k. So in this way, we was able to obtain and to the fifth time algorithm. And <laughs> <laughs> um, we analyze uh, Schreiber's algorithm more carefully and using some 
more uh, uh, nice, nice properties of, of our backbone structure. We improved our our running time to n n quadratic uh, n uh, quadratic time to take quadratic time. And finally, we use some data structure, and then we was able to find ten linear time algorithm for the time distribution path problem. Yes, that's oh. all for today. And do you have any questions? Thank you. Um, questions? Is there some more bond result for planar disjoint t pass k pass problem? Oh, yes. For planar, <coughs> the, there is no, uh, there is no published result. The <coughs> only one I know is NP hard result and complete. Without parameters by k? Yeah. Sure. Uh, so if k is also arbitrary. K is, a, k is a part of the input, uh, then it is n complete. And this reduction implies that no k to the square root of k times n times n plus minus t. Under exponential time hypothesis? Yes. Um, There is a huge gap. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, can you describe a little bit how you ensure that uh, your um, feet linkages traverse the disjoint paths in the uh, non terminal rings only once? The, the claim on the bottom, the, that yes. uh, any such traversing piece, uh, ah. any any one of these different paths is used by one traversing piece. We showed that the number of traversing pieces is at most the number of pre-computed pre-computed here, the number of these joint paths yeah. in the backbone. Because otherwise you find more paths, something like yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. It is already a disjoint path mm -hmm. connecting the two bounded curves. Uh, so, so that means by using this operation to, to push, yes. push, you just make sure that they use different paths. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh. hmm. So there, it requires some complicated argument. But intuitively, this holds because this in holds. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Any other question? Maybe we can consider the half integral disjoint passive problem where that uh, every vertex is allowed mm -hmm. to be contained in the most two passes. Mm -hmm. Then can he can he use uh, the tools to say something but similar? Over I mean I don't know I what don't is know known for planar graphs. I don't know if these two <laughs> algorithms can be extended to half integral distinct path problem. If they can be extended to half integral distribute pass problem and there is some possibility that ours can do as well. I don't know. <coughs> yeah, I saw some paper by Kenny J with uh, about half integral pass problem. For planar graphs? Uh, for general graphs and also planar graphs. Mm. Mm. No, I haven't thought about that. But it is really interesting problem.
if you look at the directed version for Playing the Grass? Uh, for the directed version, uh, the best known bound is Tutti Tutti. The key skirt times N. Only N. But this paper stands over yeah, super large. 100 pages. <laughs> so I tried, but yeah, we can. Because it looks it looks similar, but I guess there yes, is it looks similar, but it also used the irrelevant vertex technique, and then but it is really complicated. Yeah. I was not able to analyze the correct bound of the exponent. <laughs> Any other questions? Then if not, let's thank the